Well, Eric Fromm, in fact, uh, probably it was it's better pronounced, you know, Eric Fromm uh, was a psychologist in the turn of the 21st century uh, who had trained under Sigmund Freud, and if you want my thoughts on all of that, uh, I'll give it to you another time, but uh, he had trained under Freud and a few other guys and kind of thought he had the ability to summarize and identify what he called the, the personality theory. And so if any of you have ever studied psychology and you know that a lot of times psychology points to all of the issues but doesn't really offer a lot of solutions. And Fromm basically said, hey, listen, I'll tell you the three problems that everybody has in the world. And he said, number one, it's the issue of life versus death, meaning that we all um, are living, but we're all going to die and we don't want to die. And then number two, it was the issue of individual versus the group, meaning we have all these walls that go up between different ethnicities and it's hard to kind of get along. And then number three, he said, was the issue of aspiration versus achievement, which was that we all have an ideal when we're young of what we want to accomplish and who we're going to be, and then we fall short, and we go through really the last half of our life wondering if any of it ever mattered. And probably there's a few of you in the room who came in today, and maybe a lot of you, and you're going, hey, at some point in my life or even now, that's where I have been. In fact, since COVID, the depression rates in the Western world especially have skyrocketed. They're now saying that close to 20% of the next generation of students have contemplated suicide. They're also saying that about 44% of the nation is at a place where we're going, hey, there's no solution to the civil and racial divides that we're going through. In fact, get this, 45% of Generation Z is now just saying, I really don't know why I'm alive, I have no purpose, and I have no reason to get up in the morning. And so there may be a few of you in here today. In fact, if you're under the age of 25 and you're feeling that, I really want to encourage you to listen closely to what we talk about this morning. Because obviously, Fromm was not the first to identify these particular issues. These are challenges that are common to man. They've been that way since the beginning of time. And uh, if you go on an airplane today to Uganda or all the way up to Alaska, you're going to find people who go, yeah, that's exactly what I've been dealing with. If you were to go back in history and read some books, you go, that's what everyone's been dealing with. In fact, it wouldn't matter this morning if you were to go to Skid Row or all the way up to Beverly Hills. You would find people of every socioeconomic reality who would go, yeah, that's exactly what I deal with. And that's why the Bible, when you read it through cover to cover, puts those issues on basically autoplay. The playlist just repeats again and again and again. Man is broken, man is empty, man is hopeless, man is angry, man can't get out of his own way. Which is why all in one verse, we're going to study this morning, the Apostle John gives us the answer to the human condition. In fact, most of you here probably have this particular verse memorized. Luther called it the miniature gospel. It is an ocean of thought down in one little drop of water, a drop of, uh, of words, and it's an absolutely quintessential verse that from the time that we are young and little, we, most of us have memorized in the church. Can anybody guess what it is? John chapter 3, verse 16. Very good. So if you have your Bibles, open them with me to John chapter 3, verse 16, and let's get into this beautiful verse together. And if you came into the room and you're struggling... You're going, I'm not sure why I live, I'm not sure why I exist, I'm not sure why I woke up this morning, or maybe a friend or family member invited you to the church. John wants you to see the solution this morning. Uh, And maybe you're new and (laughs) you've not been with us. Uh, The backstory here is that Jesus has just launched his ministry, and John is his closest compatriot. You know, he's walking with him and watching him launch his ministry, and Jesus has grabbed a few guys, and they made their way up to Jerusalem, and When they got there for the first Passover, Jesus looks around and there's a bunch of greedy, materialistic mongrels and scoundrels that are running the show. And so Jesus flips over the tables and causes a big ruckus, and immediately the Jewish leaders of Israel send their their deployment, they send their best to ask questions. We, a couple of weeks ago or last week, called him Ben Shapiro because he was an elite leader. He had a heritage behind him. He had a lot of good morals. He was very logical. And in all the pandemonium, they were sending the man that they thought embodied their best And of course, he approaches Jesus and talks to him all night. And Jesus says, hey, listen, you're a smart guy. You've given your life to a lot of great things. But the reality is, is if the kingdom were to come today, you would not be part of it. You'd miss it entirely. And it's right there in John chapter 3 that John sticks in the truth that Nicodemus, we called him Ben Shapiro, but also many of us are missing. And so if you have your Bible, we got it there. One verse, John 3, 16 We're going to work through the greatest lover, the greatest gift, and the greatest outcome, 
And we'll put all three of those on the screen for you this morning, okay? So if you haven't memorized, let's go ahead and say it together. Here we go. John 3, 16. All right, by the show of hands, who has it memorized? Okay, you ready? Here we go. I'm watching you and you watch me. For God, now you look down. You can't do that. That's cheating. So come on. Here we go. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not but have everlasting. Very, very, very good. All right, so clause number one. You ready? The greatest lover, the greatest gift giver. Here we go. Clause number one. For God so loved the world. And that's the fact that John puts right in front of us. He put it right in front of Nicodemus back then. And he says, this is something you have to know, buddy, if you want to have entrance into the kingdom. God so loved the world. And every single one of those words matters. We'll just work our way right through them. God. God. Now, obviously, here he's talking about the Christian God, the God of the Bible, the triune God. Because Jesus, John chapter 1, came and he said, hey, listen, I was with God, right? And I want you to know I also, I'm going to teach you about God, but I am, in fact, God. So that's the God we're talking about here. Not the Hindu God, not the Mormon God, not the Muslim God, not the New Age God, okay? None of those. We're talking about the God of the Bible. He is eternal. He is self-existing. He is uncreated. He is omniscient. He is omnipotent. He is omnipresent. He is the creator and standard of the universe who is adored by angels and the seraphim stand in his presence and then they cover their faces and cry, holy, holy, holy. That's the God we're talking about, the transcendent creator of the universe, the Christian God. Everyone got that? For God, he says, now here's what's key, he took the initiative The emperor, the king, came down, condescended, and he so loved. Now, that's important. That adverb of degree is important. So loved. Not just loved. He so loved. Because what he's saying is is his character, his God, is attached to that level of love. He is eternal. Therefore, this love that he's going to show is eternal. He is unchanging. Therefore, his love is unchanging, meaning it's going to be love that begins from forever past. It's going to go on into forever future, and it's unchanging, meaning nobody can ever stop it. And when he chooses to take that love and set it down upon a group of people, there is nothing the world, the flesh, the devil, or anybody can do to stop it. That's the point that he's making. This is real love, a true choice of the will to give someone else their best. Now, real important to understand, there's a difference between fake love and real love and romantic love and real love, right? We all, in our movies today, love the early love, and then in movies, you see, we often love the later in life love. I mean, the early love we all get, right? You see a movie, and you've watched these. It's a rom-com, and people are walking down the street, and suddenly they look over to the right, and they see somebody, and their eyes connect, and the movie music begins to swell, right? And all of us love watching that, but then... When the couple walks down the aisle, that's it. It's kind of over. We go, okay, cool. And then there's the late in life love where our wife makes us watch a movie where there's an older couple who's in, in, literally in the hospital bed and they're holding hands and then they die together, right? So everyone has those two versions of love. Let me just go ahead and put in front of you, I propose, that real love is the stuff that happens in the middle. We'll call it middle love. Okay, middle love is like for 35 years where you and I are holding on when we got diapers and we got bad breath and the dog is waking us up and we're going, no, I'm going to love you, I'm going to hold on, I'm going to care for you because it's a choice of the will. You understand? So at a a level infinitesimally higher, infinitely higher, he says, listen, the love of God is something that is a choice. It's going to come at you whether you are worth it or not, whether you are going to be doing the right thing or not. It's going to be the love of God towards you as the creature just simply because he chose to do it. Now here's the last word in the clause. Ready? For God so loved, what's the last word? The world. See, now now all the universalists, when you get to that word, they go, woo! Woo! I told y'all, we's all in. It's like a pie in the sky, big God up there, you know. Doesn't matter who you are, what you believe, we're all going to be there together, right? That, that's the universalist. But that's not how John uses the word cosmos. See, John is talking about a moment where Jesus is talking to a Jewish leader, and he doesn't use that word in the quantitative sense, like the whole world is just all going to be saved, and whatever you do, you're going to be there in heaven with God. He's using it in the qualitative sense. 
And what he's saying is, is that every type of person is going to be allowed in. It's no longer Nicodemus going to be a Jewish thing. It's going to be a Gentile thing. It's going to be every creed. It's going to be every tongue. It's going to be every tribe. God's going to love groups of people from all over the world. It's no longer a Jewish national thing. It's now going to be open to the rest of the world as well. That's what he talks about. That's what he means. You go, well, how do you know that? Well, think about John chapter 17, verse 9, when Jesus said, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for my guys. How about this in Romans chapter 9? You remember what Paul said when he said, Jacob I loved, but Esau I what? Yeah, so make sure you understand. There is a general creating love of God, a general benevolence where he looks at his creatures. We call it common grace. And he goes, hey, listen, you go ahead and do what you want. I'm going to let you have family, let you have friends, have another day to be alive. You can go ahead and laugh. You can go ahead and do what you Have a great time. I'll send rain. We got a lot of that this weekend. And the sun's going to come out. That's all. But my redeeming love, my personal love, my saving love, my special love, that's for a unique group. That's for a special group that I'm putting my hand upon, and no one can ever take that away from them. See, now, if you're in here in the room, and you're a universalist, and maybe you're not technically one, but you kind of think that way, you need to hear this truth. I was talking to one guy recently, and he, he, was, he was saying you know, how he was, he was involved in some sin. I said, hey, you think God's okay with this? You know what he said? He said, he said yeah. I said, well, you know, why, why do you say that? Well, because God's okay with these kinds. I said, so then I added to it and teased it out. I said, so you mean to tell me if you did X, then God would be okay with that as well? He goes, yeah, I think so. So then I made it even worse. I said, so you mean to tell me that if, if you did X and then Y, and I added something that everyone in the room is going to go, yeah, it's totally a sin. He's, you think God's going to be okay? He said, yeah, yeah, totally. I think he'll be okay with that, all right? I said, so you mean to tell me that God's okay? He kind of, God's responding to your opinions? God's basically responding to the things that you say, feel, and think, and do, and he basically just does whatever you want? He said, yeah, I kind of think so. Now, a question for you. In that particular situation, who is God? Yeah, that man has a God, doesn't he? Who's the God? He is. If you're in the room and you're going, hey, I kind of think I can do whatever I want and God's going to love me. You know who God is? Your God. And by the way, we make crummy gods. You and I are a trash God. How's that? You, you don't believe me? You want to go out and try it? You make the sunrise, make the sunset. See, this morning, I would have been a trash God. I was on the way in here. It's Easter morning. And there was some person going like 48 miles per hour on the freeway. And I'm behind him thinking, if I was you, God, I'd be sending lightning down to strike this person right now on Easter Sunday. I'm not going to be a good God, and you're not going to be a good God. See, the reason right here that you're in the room this morning is because God put you in a position where the mirror of truth can be held up and you can begin asking questions of yourself. Have I met the love of God, the transforming love of God, the life-changing love of God? Am I one of those that God has looked down upon and I've responded to his love and it's forever changed my life? Yes or no? John says, God so loved the world that number two, number two, look at this, look at the gift that he gave. Because if the fact is there's a divine love, then it has to come with a divine offering. It says in verse 16, for God so loved the world, finish it with me, that he gave his only begotten son. You got it? So let's just start with give. I mean, we all know that giving is the best way to showcase our love. And we all do that on a human level. In fact, some of you husbands have learned that your wife loves gifts. But I have a question for you. In the Bible, whenever you see the love of God, what do you see connected to it within just a few words? Anybody guess? Nothing. Okay. When you see the love of God in the Bible, you do not see it connected to creation. When you see the love of the Bible, love in the Bible, you don't see it connected to the love of God in the Bible. You don't see it connected to the fact you got a family or that you have these goosebumps when you pray and there's a little breeze in the air and you go, wow, God, you're blessing. That's not what we see in the Bible. You know what we see? When you see the love of God in the Bible within only a few words, you're always going to see, you ready? The cross. The cross. For God demonstrated his love toward us. In that while we were yet sinners, Christ what? He died for us. Fascinating in the Bible how when you see this concept of God's love, it always comes like peanut butter and jelly to the cross. That's why he says, 
For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. And if you weren't here and you missed the study in John chapter 1 and 2, that's what John's done is he spent the last two chapters trying to make sure we understand who this son was. The second member of the Trinity, co-eternal, co-substantial with God, who literally assumed human flesh. He assumed human nature. He came down, he condescended, lived a perfect life, died a substitutionary death, and he did it all for the choice to love a group of people and redeem them unto himself, which means, by the way, the Trinity was not confused and sitting there going, God the Father going, hey, Jesus, you need to go down there and save that group of people who messed it up for us. But actually, the Trinity was in one accord saying, and Jesus said, I'm going to go down there. We're going to redeem this group of people. And that was the plan from the beginning, a part of the eternal decree. Because the greatest gift anyone can ever give is themselves. In fact, I was sitting with um, a couple recently, and about a year ago now, and they were in the counseling office, and it was interesting because the guy was very, 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 um, I'll say it, I'll say it, he was rude. He was so fired up that he looked at his wife, and at one point, he actually, like, raised his voice, and she's this, like, meek, sensitive, kind woman, and he turns over, and he looks at her, and he just berates her. He says, do you know all that I've given you? I gave you a cars, and I gave you a house, and I gave you Hawaii. There's this big pause, and I'm watching this, this, this little wife, she's kind of like, fall, and all of a sudden, she just rises up like a dragon, and she looks him in the eyeballs, and she says, but you never gave me you. That's how I felt. I was like, okay, well, it's about time to lock this up, so we're going to have to come back in, in seven days, Right? See, we all know that the greatest gift that anyone can ever give another is themselves. So get this. The divine love is expressed through, you ready, the giving of the divine son. God said, I'm giving you me. Now, some of you in the room are probably you know, newer to church, and you're going, well, why would he do that? Well, you're God. Why, why not just kind of, you know, say, hey, why the suffering thing? Why 33 years? Why did Jesus have to come? You know, why not just go down there, pick a group of people, and bring them unto yourself, and then let them sing songs and kind of sit on clouds forever and be your people? Why, why do I do all that? Because, you ready, of the nature of God. See, God is perfect. God is holy, okay? So he looks down and he sees his law has been broken and a penalty must be given. So he sends his son Jesus so that then he would forever be free according to his perfect character to place eternal life upon those to whom he wills. He is now both just and justified. And right there, we begin to see the answer to all of those, end quote, psychological dilemmas. You, you come in the room today and you go, well, hey, listen, man, I got that whole life-death thing going on where I, I want to live, but I know that one day I'm going to die. You know what God says? He says, I'll go ahead and take care of that for you. Check. If you came in the room today and you're going, listen, I'm really tired of all the walls and the racial issues and ethnic, ethnic animosity, you know, and God goes, hey, listen, guess what? Forever, I'm going to take care of that for you. Check. If you came in the room today and you're like, man, I'm aspiring to do things, but I'm always falling short. I'm not achieving everything that I thought I was going to. And you're going, my life is not what I should have added up to be. God goes, listen, hey, I'm going to go ahead and take care of that one for you as well. Check, 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 check. All the things you could never do as a human, guess what? I sent my son to come die and we're going to do it for you. Which leads to number three. Finish it with me. Eyeballs, for God so loved the world that he gave the greatest gift so that whoever, what, believes would not but have everlasting. Number three, the greatest outcome. Look at verse 16. That whoever believes in him should not perish. But so he moves right from the fact, right to the proof or the evidence, and then right to the choice, the opportunity that's in front of us all. Let's look at every one of those words. They all matter again. Whoever believes... Now, pause right there, okay? There is so much confusion around belief. Because there are some of you who come in the room and you like grew up in, old, in like Disney, Disney stuff. Okay? Oh, that's another sermon for another time. I got a whole bunch of issues there. You grew up in the religion of Disney and fairy tales. And belief to you is defined as like, 
I just believe upon a star, and there's fairy tales up there wherever you are, and it's kind of this beautiful, and then some of you, though, you grew up in evangelicalism, where you came in the room, here's what belief means to you, you said, well, I was at camp when I was eight years old, and I walked down, and prayed a prayer, man, and I just said the thing, I recited it, and a pastor came over, put his hands on my shoulders, and said, son, you're going to heaven, don't ever doubt it. So whether you come in the room and you're a Disney guy or gal, whether you come in the room and you're an evangelical kind of easy believer, here's the problem. The Bible calls both of those, you ready, demon faith. That word believe, that word trust, right, James 2, 19, that's, that's demon faith. I believe in him and, I, and the demons shudder. They go, wow, he's God, he's Lord, but I'm not going to change my life. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 though says that faith is the substance of things hoped for. That word substance meaning the title deed where a person understands the inheritance that's been offered them and they hold on to the title deed which has been signed in blood and they're literally claiming it to the point that it redirects the very course of their life and every decision that they make is based on the title deed that they hold and then the destination to which they plan to be. be. That's faith. That's trust. See, that means that if you come in the room today and you're like, well, hey, I believe. Let me give you an example in the real world, okay? Real world. Some of you right now, picture the fact you have, let's just imagine you have cancer. God forbid that you do. But tomorrow morning, you find out you have cancer and the doctor looks at you and he says, hey, listen, we're going to have to start this medication and we're going to have to go ahead and begin radiation ASAP. Now, now you you look at him and you go, "I, I trust you, doc, right? Smart guy. And so you stand up with your family You turn around, and instead of starting the medication and the radiation, what do you do? You get on your phone, and you start looking for second opinions or third opinions. And a week goes by, and you haven't started your medication or your radiation. Now, question for you. Ready? Have you showcased the fact that you trusted that doctor, yes or no? You listened to that doctor. You affirmed that doctor. You might even mentally assent that doctor as one of the options. But I'm going to ask you again, have you showcased the fact that you truly trust that doctor? Now, obviously, the answer is is no. You understand how many people are doing the exact same thing with Jesus? Hey, Jesus, I I, I believe in you, but I'm not going to follow you. Jesus, I believe in you, I'm not going to obey you. Jesus, I believe in you, I'm not going to redirect my life for you. Come on, church, finish it with me. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. That's belief. That's belief. Whoever believes, pushes themselves all in on the person of Christ. The second minister, what does he say? Look at it, finish it. Will not perish. Now, we're going to have a couple of you in the room who are going, man, uh, it's 2024. There's certain things we don't talk about, like the whole judgment thing, the hell thing, you know. Listen, um, I'm not talking about it. The Bible's talking about it, okay? So you can go to a lot of other churches and not hear it. You come to this church, you're going to hear it. What we're saying is, is that real simple. If you want to do things your own way, you want to handle your business with God one day on your own, you want to unzip from this body, it's going to happen. You're going to zip your body, your soul's going to go on. You want to stand there before the Lord, who made you in all of his holy perfections. And the flaming purity of his eyes are piercing right through everything you've ever said, everything you've ever thought, everything you've ever done. And oh, by the way, it's not just the stuff you've done in public, it's the stuff you've done in private. You understand that, right? If you want to go to heaven and stand before God on judgment day and go, hey, Lord, I want to give you an X, Y, Z of why I should be allowed into your perfections, he says, you go right ahead and you do it. Can you imagine that, by the way? Remember that one time when I, like, Fed the homeless guy down under the overpass. And the Lord's like printing out the roster of every moment of lust you've ever had. But, but Lord, don't you remember the one time that I helped the old lady across the street? And he's like printing out the roster of every word you've ever said against your wife. Can you imagine? And he says, if you want to do that, you go ahead. But here's the problem. It ain't going to work out well. So you go ahead and take those unquenchable thirsts 
and the terrible passions and the mad cravings and the inflamed desires and the fierce longing and the furious hate and the white-hot temper and the spine-chilling fear into burning darkness and you enjoy making small talk with Stalin, with Nero, with Hitler, and with Jeffrey Epstein forever. If that's what you want, just go for it, he says. Can you imagine not only being in burning darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth, but you're there with your own self constantly dealing with all the tortured anxieties of knowing the heaven you missed out on because you rejected the moments of truth when they were put in front of you. He said, but if that's what you want to do, man, you just go for it. Or, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not go through that but would have eternal life. Interesting here, he uses two different tenses. Eris subjunctive on perish, which is you die and you stay, Versus present tense on eternal life, meaning you're going to go and you're going to forever be with God. Because what he does is the judge goes over and he becomes a father and he declares you not guilty, takes his own robes off of his son, adopts you as his own, and says from this point forward, because of Jesus, you're going to be known as a son and a daughter of the king. I mean, just imagine right now, you're driving home, I don't know why, you're going to Easter, having fun, you're so pumped up on Jesus that you go home and you're driving I'm pick a number, 101 miles per hour. How's that? And the 5 0 pulls you over. You're like, oh, no, man, I shouldn't have done that. You knew you shouldn't have done that. And so he pulls you over. He says, sir, you've been drinking. You say, no, I'm high on Jesus. <laughs> it's Easter, sir. I'm just pumped up, man. I want to get my hunt, my Easter egg hunt. You know, whatever. So you're pumped up, right? He goes, sir, you're over 100 miles per hour. I'm going to take you in. And so you're like, okay, I understand, you know. And then. You end up going down to the, to, to the to county lockup. And now here's the crazy thing. is because it's Santa Ana, your dad is one of the judges there. So tomorrow morning, you wake up on Monday morning. Get this. You walk in because your dad is a very, very, very just man. And you walk into the courtroom. And here you are in your little orange jumpsuit with your cuffs on. The bailiff stands you in front of your dad. And you're wondering... And from this big flowing gown, he grabs the gavel and he says, Sir or ma'am, women are sinners too. Is it true that you were driving 101 miles per hour on, on the freeway on the 405 during Easter? And you say, Yes, 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 sir, I plead guilty. There's video footage. And then immediately the gavel comes up and he says, $2,200, $22,000 fine or five days in lockup. You're like, I don't got $22,000 in the bank, Dad. Off with him. Bailiff comes and he takes you and you got your cuffs behind you, you know, and you're just walking. And right when you get to the hallway, everyone knows the story. You know where I'm going. All of a sudden, the judge stands up. Dad stands up with his flowing black gown. And he says, halt! And he reaches into his briefcase and he pulls out his checkbook and his pen and he calls the the bailiff over in the court recorder and he begins to write a $22,000 check and he hands it to the court recorder and he says, the penalty has been paid. A judge that was so just, he had to penalize. But a judge that is so loving He offers to pay it himself. See, what John is saying is you can go on and you can choose to stand in front of God and you can pay it yourself. Or you can humble yourself, fall to your face, turn around and take the free offer that's been given you in Jesus. And trust that the judgment has already fallen upon another. See? That brings us all the way back around to where we started. Do you have a life-death problem? You bet you do. You got an individual group problem? You bet you do. You got an aspiration versus achievement problem? Oh, you bet your bottom you do. All have fallen short of the glory of God. So what's the answer? God so loved the world that he gave his only son 
that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life.